Because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. And yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood, an afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it? Perhaps four or five times more? Perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20. And yet it all seems limitless. is my beloved true seekers it is sacrilege and concentrated phoenix egg yolk apostasy in the shape of a fundy petrifying medusa head an iconoclasm in all its holy waterboarding possibilities that's what we're all about that's all we've ever felt free with that's why you have arrived to the place you can be higher than the gods and more human than human. 300 years ago, you'd have been burned at the stake. So with kindness and love, I welcome you to Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, broadcast from the virtual Alexandria through the godabovegod.com. Each week, Aeon Byte brings you the Promethean wisdom of the best and the brightest, the bold and the blasphemous. We present to you the forbidden orchards of Gnosticism, the Esoterica, the Occult, and Dionysian Freethought. We shy away from scholarly pontification and definitely shy away from New Age babble. We don't take prisoners but liberate them. Divided we stand, together we rise. Fiery the angels fell, deep thunder rolled around their shores. Burning with the fires of Aeon Bite is not the final authority on anything, but hopes to be an endless possibility for everything. And most importantly, a small light, a bottled firefly, if you would, that you can hopefully cultivate into a supernova that will light your own personal road to Emmaus, towards your own resurrection into a living Logos who like Mary Magdalene in the Dialogue of the Savior, has knowledge of the All by simply tapping into your indwelling divine spark, your own misplaced childhood dreams. But where is it written that all our dreams must be small ones? And together, as always, like the ancient Gnostics, we're writing our own Gospels and living our own myths. And we're certainly going to rage against heaven and its Cerberus guardian, owning the three heads of intolerance, collectivism, and ignorance. I am, and I am Abraxas, your psychopomp between the lands of the Hylic ants that cover Gaia's crusty skin, all the way to the farthest shores of imagination where we are baptized in the living waters of Sophia and initiated into the mysteries of Hermes thrice great. But I speak to you in one of my mortal incarnations called Miguel Connor, although his insufferable palaver tends to make you mentally sterile until our astral guests can come to the rescue and impart the fruits of gnosis of good and evil you so much hunger for. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. And what an astral guest we have on this approximately Saturday, May 8th, the year of our Demiurge 2010, for a very special occasion I'll be traced soon enough. With us in this eternal now, we have Barbara G. Walker, the very groundbreaking scholar in the fields of mythology comparative religion and feminist studies. 
Although best known for her landmark book, The Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, Barbara has written over 20 books on a wide array of spiritual, anthropological, and humanist topics, including the Tarot, fairy tales, crystals, the I Ching, the goddess in various cultures, skeptic philosophies, and plenty, plenty of knitting. And please don't laugh. Knitting here in the Midwest is serious business, I tell ya, that cuts across all genders, races, and economic levels. Certainly a powerful ritual of meditation and artistic expression. If I don't finish my meditation, uh, I tend to get a little cranky. Barbara joins us to discuss her new book, Man Made God, a collection of potent essays that articulates her personal trials and journeys into soul liberation, a condensed recap of her theological insights that would make your average fundagelical run in terror and climb up Pat Robertson's closest orifice. I got the law to protect me. I ain't scared of the likes of you. It also contains amazing disclosures into the dreamscapes of comparative mythology and its consciousness expanding secrets and chilling historical evidence of the atrocities of Jehovah and his trickle-down testosterone that has given us so many wonderful thousands of years of warfare, oppression of minorities, and iron fist dogmas gripping the collective testicles of humanity's innate creative spirit. After all, the Orthodox Jesus said he would come not to bring peace, but a sword. And like Robert Ingersoll said, that is the one prophecy in the Bible that ever came true. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition! And threading these themes is a brilliant expose on the long history of the almost forgotten goddess archetype in various civilizations, as well as the hope of glory of the return of the goddess archetype. After all, she has been buried underneath the draconian and honestly insecure rise and rule of so many male deities who really have small penises and make it up by subjugating their creations. Call no man happy who is not dead. Or perhaps it's the other way around, my beloved shoe seekers. Perhaps, like the Gospel of Philip says, we do make our gods. And those priests and politicians with their petite dinghies decide to make them in their own image. And here we are in the 21st century, on the brink of so many doomsdays beyond the physical and environmental ones. The dark ages knocking at our doors like some true blood vampire just waiting for us to invite him in once again and once and for all. It's a simple question of weight ratios. A five ounce bird could not carry a one pound coconut. Needless to say, beyond a truly edifying read, man-made God is an important semaphore alerting us to the important crossroads we're at today. And Barbara clearly signals all the wrong roads, more like psychic bantam death marches that will send us to eventual grimy ditches of historical past without rights or reason or imagination will relive over and over again, sort of like the Middle East is doing as we speak. I believe that as a species, human beings define their reality through misery suffering. An Aeon Bite has been foghorning you on the wrong roads ever since its inception, using the warning of the Gnostics 2,000 years ago and the Song of Sophia that calls to her unruly son to remember where he came from and that without his full faculties, his lost Shekinah, he will never be nothing more than what most of us humans are egocentric half-makers and emotional conquistadores and self-appointed supreme beings in our own personal Old Testaments. If there is a God, he did not mean this to be so. And I should add that Man-Made God has some wonderful chapters on the Gnostics themselves, 
who have always been friends of those seeking to break through the holographs of the Black Iron Prison. Whether it be the Enlightenment era philosophers dueling with the Choich, the Renaissance artists painting their ways into a new age of freedom, the Southern Front's troubadours and Kabbalists spreading egalitarianism against a crusading world, the 19th century occultists fighting Victorian age asphyxiation, or so many 20th century writers deciphering the nausea of a fast-moving postmodern world and its phantoms of materialism and social experimentation. The voice of the Gnostics is always there to guide the hero of a thousand faces through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. Barbara Walker's man-made God should definitely reach your hands if you're seeking acquisition of the dangerous truth. It will soak your brain with information that will certainly disturb you to the core, but eventually amaze you at how the human spirit has survived countless centuries of male God money shots. Fuck damnation, man. Fuck redemption. We are God's unwanted children. So be it! And the special occasion, my beloved true seekers, is that Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio has reached its fourth anniversary. Yes, happy birthday to my drivel. Happy birthday that my drivel has survived four years. But the important part is that it has been a platform for so many horror show scholars, mystics, artists, and free thinkers of all pedigrees. Four years once upon a time known as coffee, cigarettes, and noses, and broadcasting the caliphates of rabid atheism called freethoughtmedia.com. It was a disaster. I still don't know why I do it. I still don't understand how I've lasted this long. I still don't know the reasons for this Adam podcast, but perhaps there are no reasons except, I don't know. Perhaps this is our joint effort in writing our own gospels and living our own myth. But more on this after the interview. In other words, and you know what I'm going to say? Enough of my drivel. Barbara Walker on her new book, Man Made God. Steiner. Steiner. Yay, believe in me and ye shall find peace. Yeah, 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 we've heard that crap for about 2,000 years now. We want to hear something new. It's the year 2000 for Christ's sake. Yeah! Well, what do you want? We want to see God! Yeah, with our own eyes. Yeah! Yeah. We followed blindly for thousands of years and we think the least God can do is show up for New Year's Eve 1999. Yeah! Oh, uh, let me think about that for a minute. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we have the pleasure of having Barbara Walker to discuss her new book, Man Made God. How are you doing today, Barbara? I'm just fine, Miguel. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, Again, thank you for joining Aeon Byte. Did you write these articles for the sole purpose of the book, or were these sort of diaries or notes you decided to publish after many years of research and putting out so many books? Actually, it's more the latter. This is the 24th of 23 things that I've published so far. But these essays were actually written as lectures, and I've been giving them at various um, Unitarian and Humanist meetings and groups over the years. And I've managed to finally collect them into a book. And I think they they follow a particular theme, of course. Um, but they've been very popular at being presented as lectures. And uh, many of your articles in Man-Made God deal with your own personal journey from a theist into a free thinker, a humanist, starting from a very young age. Uh, could you give us some of the reasons you left religion? It seems one of the earliest ones or one of the first signals was actually the death of your dog. Yeah, well, actually that one is the first one in the book, and it's the only one that deals with my personal background. But that was probably the original impulse that led me away from religion. 
when I was quite young, I was grieving for the death of this dog that I loved very much. And our minister came to visit my mother, and I asked him to tell me about how I would see my dog again in heaven. And he told me that there are no dogs allowed in heaven because dogs don't have souls. This is still the teaching of most Christian churches. And I was appalled. And he said, tried to comfort me by saying, well, you'll meet all your relatives again, all your friends, all your relatives will be there. And I tried to negotiate. I said I would be willing to trade a couple of aunts and uncles for my dog (laughs) if I could just have my dog back. And this didn't work. He insisted that animals are soulless and my dog is gone forever. And eventually I just threw a tantrum and cried and I said, I don't want any part of this heaven and God is mean and he can leave me out. And I ran away and my mother made me come back and apologize. And But I really didn't know what for. And I didn't like that minister ever since. And that was my first in nation that God is not a nice person. So then uh, by the time I became a teenager, I started reading the Bible and then finding out what a monster the Old Testament God is. He condones slavery and rape and genocide and all those terrible things. And uh, When I went to Sunday school, I wanted to know why did God want to kill Jesus? Why not just forgive everybody without making Jesus die? And my Sunday school teacher would not answer that and, in fact, scolded me for asking my questions, of which I had many. So all in all, my relationship with the church, the Episcopalian church, as it was, was not a happy one. (laughs) To say the least. And uh, going to the crux of the matter, I think one of the most powerful lines in your whole book and uh, do you really believe this? And when you write, or I believe you quote, women who cling to the biblical worldview will never achieve their full humanity. Well, I think that's true, because the biblical worldview certainly is one that puts down women. In the New Testament, women are told that they must not speak at church. They must ask their husbands at home if they have questions. Women are not allowed to have any part in the services. And throughout most of history, churches have adhered to this. They have not allowed women to be ordained, although now we have female ministers and we have female rabbis, although the Catholic Church has yet to ordain priestesses. But it's not just that. Throughout Christian history, women have been very much abused by religious authorities. When I first found out about sexism, I thought it had very little to do with religion. It was just part of a social, a cultural phenomenon, so to speak. But as I was researching the history of religion, I found out that that is indeed the the source of sexism. The whole story about original sin and how it was all Eve's fault and how women are second-rate citizens because men are the ones that were made first. And then I thought, well, you know, um, actually, Eve was the one who was made out of genuine flesh and blood, and Adam was made out of dirt. (laughs) So maybe he was the secondary one. Anyway, that was a joke that I told myself a long time ago. Also, religion has been violent all the way along. The pogroms, the crusades, the inquisition, wars, endless wars. Practically every war in Western civilization has had a religious overtone. Even Hitler was a good Catholic. And the crusades were abominable. The pogroms against Jews were abominable. It's been a violent religion all the way along. And so that's another reason why I found it. Um, but I'll read a little passage about that from Please do. one of my essays, if that's okay. Please do. Good and evil ambiguity is rife in the world even today. It is deemed evil for men to kill other men, but they can be ordered to do so by their government. 
And yet, the government does not thus become evil. Indeed, the theologians say that these orders are permitted and encouraged by God, who is apparently quite willing to suspend his loving kindness and mercy in matters of political expediency. No nation has ever declared a war that that same nation's clergy unanimously condemned. God is circumspect enough to support temporal power in any endeavor. God has no problem with the killing of thousands of men, women, and children whom a government considers enemies, even though he has a huge problem with the killing of one unwanted fetus, or even with the prevention of an unwanted fetus during birth control. So we have a pretty ambiguous God there. Yeah, yes, indeed, and a whole history of oppression. Uh, some of your statistics are pretty chilling, like uh, you write how in the burning times, something like nine million women were killed in an era, councils in which women were considered soulless, and uh, the, the list just goes on in your book. It's, it's, it's terrible. People are not aware of the awfulness that has been perpetrated in the name of religion, in among the 400 reference books that I read was the classic work on the Inquisition by Henry Charles Lee. And he studied documents, original documents, in the Vatican Library. And he said at the time that they were already beginning to destroy quite a few of these records. The Catholic Church now admits to only what they call only a few hundred thousand. Uh, deaths under the Inquisition. But I think they are writing their own history, as they have so many times before. And I think a lot of this destruction has already taken place, because Lee was studying there in the 19, early 1900s. The history is written by the winners, as we know, and they're among the winners. But Barbara... Why don't we go to the uh, once upon a time or the beginning of the end. Uh, societies were once matriarchal, or at least they were more egalitarian, where everybody had a role uh, way before the Bronze Age. From mm -hmm. your research, what happened that humanity fell into the thrall of patriarchal societies and then created their gods and their image? What happened, basically, was that gradually men came to understand that they could be fathers, that they had a role to play in reproduction. For the first, oh, maybe million years of human existence, males did not know any more than any other animal males that they could beget young. As far as they knew, females were the only things that could produce life. And that this gave the mothers a great deal of, uh, shall we say, mana, spiritual power. And the early um, human associations, clans, were all mother-based. They, they consisted of the grandmother and her, ch her children and the children's children and the siblings, and they became a tribe. So we find in, in ancient societies primitive societies, there is this mother clan system. Men do not know that they beget children, but they, their loyalty is to their sisters and their mothers and their sisters' children. And even in pre-Christian Britain, when the first missionaries got there, they found that there was a matriarchal system and men did not know fatherhood. And the important male relative for every child was the maternal uncle. The, the mother's brother, because that was where the blood bond went. Even in the 20th century, uh, anthropologists have found this same system in many uh, so-called primitive societies. So we know that the recognition of fatherhood was quite late in human history. After all, it's not apparent. And they did not have any such system as monogamy, which was instituted for the sake of keeping the woman married to one man so that all the children would be his. That was a very late development. In early writings in Phoenicia and Babylon, 
we find that they speak of a time when no man knew his father, no child knew his father, but the mothers were the ones who established the clans. So it has been a fairly late development. We didn't find out about it as a species until maybe five or 6,000 years before our era, which compared to two or three million is a long time. And as you write, this really wasn't an overnight thing. Uh, oh, no. Even in the Bronze Age and beyond, the goddess always had an important role in every society, whether it was Egyptian, Babylonian, Sumerian, right? Right. And the early kings in Egypt and, and other countries in the Near East, early kings had to be married to a surrogate for the goddess. The, uh, the, the queen was a sort of high priestess. And so the king had to be a consort of the goddess in order to get the, the imprimatur, the, the ability to rule. And this went on until fairly late, even in Italy, uh, in pre-Roman Italy, the Latin, um, the, the Etruscans, had this same system. And they called the Juno, the, the goddess that became the mother goddess in Rome, Juno was a name in Latin for the female soul, comparable to genius, which meant the man, male soul and also meant begetter, one who can beget. Now, of course, we have lost the word Juno. We don't have female soul divinity anymore, but we kept the word genius, which now means superior intelligence. It's interesting what we have done with language uh, as a result of all this for example, what we do with names. We have tons and tons of names that end in son. Robertson, Peterson, Williamson. All to identify somebody as the son of some male. Uh, we also have the female version. Peters, Johns, Roberts, Williams, Adams. Which, although it's not a son, it probably indicated a daughter to begin with. But she still belongs to her father. And so our nomenclature is very patriarchal right there. It's all a matter of trying to maintain the father's authority over the family, or what became the, uh, the, the monogamous family. And Barbara, when did the hammer finally come down completely on the goddess? Would you say it was the rise of the cult of Yahweh, or before that... When did finally the goddess get shunted aside? Actually, later than that. When Christianity was conquering Europe in the 2nd to 5th centuries, there were still many goddess temples scattered all over the Roman Empire. And most of them were preempted, and the goddess figures were turned into various saints, you know, Our Lady of this, Our Lady of that. And then the people were still going to the same shrine, but they have now turned it into a Christian shrine. A great many saints, female saints, were originally goddesses. Then when they conquered Europe, which really didn't happen overnight, I mean, that took many centuries. Um, they were fighting the pagans all the way along. And matter of fact, Christianity did not take root in Ireland until the 12th century or in Scandinavia until sometime later than that. So they still maintained their pagan deities and their rituals and so on. The goddess figures were also absorbed into the figure of Mary. Many of them became, their statues and paintings were interpreted as various images of Mary. And their legends were turned into various uh, shapes of Mary, or Mary Magdalene, or some other Christianized figure. But the, 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 Christ, the Catholic Church took it over in pieces, so to speak. Every time they came across people worshiping a female, they simply said, "Well, this is you know this is another." figure of the virgin or this is a female saint and they would invent a legend to go with her and there there we are with another christian part of the christian polytheism which really is polytheism 
because saints are worshipped like little godlets too. So there are many ways of, of taking over. Then they also officially said that every pagan deity, female or male, is a devil. And that was yet another device for discrediting them. And so we have the Christian devil having inherited all of the pagan attributes. He's got the horns and the goat feet of Faunus or Pan. He's got the the pitchfork of Poseidon or Neptune. You know, all of these little trappings came from paganism, as indeed did the whole Christian story. Why do you think Christianity was so volatile towards uh, the feminine? I mean, obviously, it started, the Gnostics revered the feminine, and they were wiped out. Why were they so against it? I think it was because, um, influenced perhaps by the same movement going on in northern India among the Aryans, they believed, they came to believe that sexuality was very sinful and that the only way to assure oneself of a place in heaven was to completely eliminate sexuality from your life. This was the ascetic movement, which was a very big part of early Christianity. Among the Gnostics, there were ascetics and there were the non-ascetics who actually engaged in sexual rituals. And the ascetics won out perhaps because they were more powerful, they had more money at hand, and the followers of of Constantine, who had first established Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire, were of the ascetic persuasion. So, in order to establish this kind of thing, they had to eliminate the female from their theology. Uh, As a matter of fact, Eusebius, who was one of the fathers of the church and believed in holy lying for the sake of of religion, he was one of these ascetics also. And uh, one of the early fathers that we know about followed Jesus' words in Matthew where he says that the best way for a man to be sure to get into heaven is to castrate himself. Some of them did because they believed that this was, you know, assurance of eternal life. There have always been these two influences, uh, contradictory influences, in religions in general. We have ascetics and we have non-ascetics, and I think they're still pretty much evident right today. Yeah, you would think the ascetics would lose out since they don't reproduce. So how do they do it? <laughs> They're very good with uh, propaganda. And when you make people feel guilty about their own bodies, their own sexuality, you have got a very powerful hold over them. Yeah, one of the interesting things you write in your uh, section of the children's Bible is why do we cling on to these old religions or you know as Joseph Campbell said we need a new mythology and one of your reasons well one is that they protect themselves so well and the other one is that as humans you write don't we need we want leadership we want comfort we want authority so you're basically saying as humans we're just pack animals well we want a parent figure we're born wanting a parent figure, needing a parent figure in order to live. The mother is the only one that can ensure the survival of the unfittest, which is the infant. And I think every infant deep down knows that mother is life. Mother is warmth, comfort, food, you know, whatever it needs. Any mammal does this. Any infant mammal depends totally on its mother. And among most mammals, uh, fathers have no no particular role to play. They're just not there. The function of the male among most mammals is to fight each other for access to females. That's what they do. That's their function. And nature does this to ensure that only the strongest males will get to breed and thus improving the breed. 
so, and of course, in civilized human society, we don't have this system anymore, although it may be deep buried somewhere in our limbic system. But certainly many unfit males get to breed these days. <laughs> and <laughs> and our, our society condones that. You know, that's, that's part of civilization. But I think that whatever you learn as a very, very young child tends to stay with you. It tends to give you uh, the parental guidance in a way that you need, desperately need, as a toddler. And I think it's very significant that in all religions, not just in the Bible, but in practically all the religious writings around the world, they speak about a time very close to the time of creation when there were giants and of course, every baby and every toddler knows everything about giants because they live in a world of giants, and the giants take care of them. And it's interesting also that creation myths almost invariably speak of the very first passage through darkness and the coming of light, which is certainly uh, a metaphor for birth, if there ever was one. And I think that this, too, shows that we have a certain kind of, um, inst- I, I hate to call it instinct because we don't really have instinct in the animal sense, but we have, say, an archetype at some point in our minds that leaves us forever wanting this parental figure. And no deity the world has ever created, male or female, has been anything other than a parent. The deities are always referred to as either mother or father. And so the deity we have now is called a father, but obviously it's not a father in the sense of a begetter. Yeah, he's more uh, detached, aloof. And cruel. (laughs) To say the least, he shows you his love with his fists. (laughs) So you'll learn. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, Barbara, do you see Christ as a historical figure? No, I don't. I think the majority of scholars now know that every detail of the Jesus story was taken from earlier writings, earlier uh, mythologies. Even Jesus' sayings, uh, as given in the New Testament, are taken word for word from earlier writings. The Lord's Prayer, you know, the, the Golden Rule, all of them come from other sources. So we, it's very hard for biblical scholars who want to, to identify anything that can be called originally Christian. We have, among the pagan gods, we have the virgin birth, we have the walking on water, the curing of blindness and the healing and multiplying loaves and fishes and, you know, every one of the miracles, every everything that Jesus said, does, or anything else, all unoriginal. The early fathers of the church knew all this, too, and they got around it by saying that the devil invented all these previous religions just to confuse Christians when the true Savior finally came along. But that argument doesn't wash anymore. (laughs) So we are stuck with this figure that everybody believes in now because, as has been pointed out, if you tell a lie often enough, people will eventually think it's the truth. And this particular lie has done an awful lot to shape our culture in, in both good and bad ways. And so they hesitate to really go into the scholastic Um, roots of this thing by now. There is a great deal of money at stake. Religion is a very big business. And for people to fall away from it leaves a lot of otherwise rich people getting poorer. And I think this is the, the basic cause of this intense indoctrination that, uh, the evangelists like to put people through or the, the mainstream churches, um, they know that they're, they're selling a non-product, which is, say, immortality. They take money for this hot air product, and they never have to make good on the promise, but they're paying in advance for something that 
nobody has to supply. It's a perfect scam. <laughs> it's an absolutely foolproof way to make money and give nothing in return. Yeah, you so, can't get your money back when you're dead. <laughs> that's right, and you'll never really be able to find out that it was a scam to begin with. And uh, speaking of Jesus, what I found one of you really fascinating, oh, I found all your articles very fascinating, but in your article, Logos, the Magic Word, mm -hmm. we've come to believe this notion that creation and mythology, or whether you take it literally, whatever, was ushered by either the Om of India, the Neum of the Greeks, the Logos, or the Word of God, it was Jesus, and so forth. But you write that this evocative imagery is actually just another male assertion of the feminine creative power. In other words, that blood it was really the creative force in the beginning. Yeah, of course. Blood is what they thought made a baby, because a pregnant woman does not shed blood every month. And so they figured it was staying in her body and making a baby. And so even the gods demanded blood, because that was what everybody had to live on. That was the essential uh, substance. But we are human beings and we create language. And language is our most powerful tool for cooperation and civilization. And words are terribly important to human beings. When men began to look for some kind of, some way in which they could be called creators, or their gods could be called creators, they made their gods creators by word, the magic word the secret word, the sacred name of, of God, which you cannot speak, and so forth and so on. Human beings create images and words. That is what we do. All of us can envision God or Jesus or vampires or ghosts or unicorns or fairies or trolls or angels or demons or, you know, we, we all have mental pictures of all these creatures. No such creature has ever been seen, except in visions, perhaps. But we have mental pictures, every one of us. And those pictures have been created by our language. So it's a very sacred thing that we have, the ability to communicate in words. And the ancients were justly um, impressed by their ability to make words. So naturally, words became kind of a sacred thing. Yeah, you even write that you, the originally the goddess Hecate was actually a Logos. That's what her name is, the creative power. Yes, it comes from the Egyptian H-E-K, Hec, which meant the, the sacred creative word. And when she became the Greek goddess Hecate, she was assigned to the underworld because she was the queen of the dead. She took care of souls in the afterlife. And then, of course, she was adopted by the Christian church and turned into the queen of witches much later, simply because she was a crone goddess and associated with uh, the life after death. All of those death, either death-defying or death-giving goddess figures became witch-type, uh, you know, demonized to the ancients, death was not necessarily a terrible thing. The underworld was not necessarily a hell. It was simply the place where the dead went. They, most of them believed in reincarnation, and they believed that the dead would return from the underworld, as Jesus did and as all the savior gods did as well. And so the death goddess was the one who took care of this process. So all of these goddesses that were in, involved with creating a, a new birth after death were very much in the eye of the Christian church as witch-like figures because they had a cauldron to which they restored the souls and they all went into the kind of molecular soup that the whole world is made of and then got reformed into other forms. Actually, this image is rather in line with what we know scientifically really happens. What dies becomes absorbed into other forms and becomes other things. 
and the, uh, the, the amount of matter in the, un- in the on Earth pretty much stays the same, but it changes form all the time. So this planet itself is kind of like a cauldron <laughs> of continually changing forms, and we are some of them. It seems the most vilified of all the old goddesses must be Lilith, while the most covered and censored one must be Eve. Kind of an odd dichotomy, isn't it? Well, yes. Uh, Lilith was put forth as Adam's first wife in the uh, Apocrypha. Not in the, not in the canonical Bible, but in the Apocrypha, which is older. And she was not happy with Adam because he insisted that he, she lie underneath him in a missionary position. So she gave up on him and she left him and she went away. Now this is the apocryphal story. Went away to the shores of the Red Sea and there she lived and she mated with what they call demons and gave birth to a hundred children every day. Now this, uh, this detail marks her as obviously one of the original goddess creators who gave birth to the whole world because she was giving birth to this enormous amount of stuff. And then in the canonical Bible, she was replaced by Eve, who was much more passive. But Lilith remained in tradition, particularly in Jewish tradition. Uh, She was very much feared because they turned her into a kind of sexual demon, and she was supposed to visit men in at night and cause wet dreams which would which would menace their souls and the <laughs> christian monks were taught that that when they go to sleep they have to clutch a crucifix over their genitals so that they will not oh, be visited visited by lilith <laughs> it was something they feared very much again this is the ascetic strain coming out and there's all kinds of ways of creating more asceticism but that was another of them so Lilith became known as the night hag, and her minions were the Lilim, the, uh, the sexual angels, which were very much feared on earth. However, in, uh, in Islam, the sexual angels were called Huris, and they were, trans- they were transformed, transposed into paradise to reward warriors who had died in battle very much like the uh, Valkyries in the Scandinavian mythology who took heroes who died in battle and took them into a special paradise where they could live and party all (laughs) through all eternity. (laughs) So, you know, there's a lot of different interpretations of all of these things. Yeah, but Barbara, but Eve, Eve herself is also based on a primeval goddess, isn't she? Oh, sure. Her name uh, was originally Hawa, which is a word for life, and she was one of the original goddesses of the Middle East. The town of Nineveh uh, actually means the goddess Eva, or Eve, and in Latin letters, in in Hebrew letters, it's He, Val, He, which is H-W-H. In Latin letters, this is E-V-E. And this particular word meant life or woman, you know, way back. And if you add a yod in Hebrew with a Y-H-W-H, which becomes Yava, this is actually the secret name of God. In Latin letters, it becomes I-A-V-E, I-E. Interesting, huh? And obviously, uh, another famous goddess that's been hidden in the Bible would be Ashira. She's all over it, but again, hidden. Oh, yeah. Astarte. That's God's wife. That's God's wife herself. <laughs> <laughs> well, she had a lot of names. In Greek, she was Sophia, the, which means wisdom, uh, the wisdom of God. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, Kabbalistic, tradition, she was called the Shekinah, which means the female soul of God without which he could not function. She had, she in the Bible, she's Ashtoreth or Astarte, or uh, a, another version of that was Esther, 
Esther and Mordecai in the Old Testament are simply recreations of the Babylonian deities Ishtar and Marduk, and their stories were retold in the book of Esther, pretty much. Uh, interestingly, the book of Esther is the only one in the Old Testament that never mentions Yahweh at all. He's, he doesn't appear there. But we have what is what amounts to a Babylonian scripture in the book of Esther. And it is, uh, of course, the source of the Purim festival, which is still celebrated among the Jews. And it's uh, funny how these things hang on and on and on and just sort of never go away. <laughs> right there for us to discover if we look hard enough. Yeah, isn't even the festival of Easter based on pagan goddess worship? Yeah, Eostra was the name of the Saxon goddess of springtime. And that's just another version of Astarte, Esther, you know, the, the whole that whole configuration. And according to the festival of Eostra, it was the time when the Savior God gets resurrected from the underworld, which is an image of the new crops sprouting from the seeds in the earth. And as a metaphor for the seasonal celebrations, it makes sense. But when it's uh, turned into a... <laughs> A myth that is being told as history, it makes no sense at all. All of these festivals were originally seasonal festivals because the one thing people feared all the time, every year, was the possibility of losing the food supply. And so it was very important to celebrate all of these seasonal, you know, sowing festivals, harvest festivals, fruit and vegetable growing festivals. That, that was the one thing they feared. And and if the gods got mad at them, then there would be drought and then people would die and there would be plagues and so forth, as, um, was, hap- as was done to the Egyptians, according to the Old Testament. And Barbara, what do you find is some or the most repugnant and oppressive theology that has come out of the Christian worldview? Well, the whole thing, actually. <laughs> I, I throw don't the find, baby and the bathwater out huh? <laughs> yeah absolutely I don't, don't see any virtue It's churches have tried to improve their images by doing charitable things and by claiming that they comfort people by telling them that they're going to live forever and they will not die And I'm not sure that that's all that much of a comfort. I I personally know a couple of Catholic uh, ladies who died recently in terrible fear because they thought they were going surely going to hell. And I think that's that's a very cruel idea. As far as I know, no other religion has postulated so sadistic a hell as Christianity. And frightening children with it is one of the things that they have done throughout the years, which I think sets a, a fear into into the basic basic thinking of practically anybody who's gone through that indoctrination. I think it's a very cruel idea, and the, the, the whole idea of, of worshiping a crucifix, which is an instrument of torture, is to my mind, a, a very cruel symbol. I think I forget who it was, but somebody said um, if Jesus had been sacrificed in modern times, they would worship a little tiny electric chair on lockets around their, <laughs> their, their neck <laughs> instead of a cross. But there's a lot, of, a lot of cruel imagery in Christianity, which really doesn't have to be there. Yeah, but I think, uh, as you write, and I used to think that as a child, I think something that is just as bad as hell is the fact that if we make it to heaven, and heaven is true, that we'll have to sit around for eternity singing hymns to God. <laughs> yeah. That's I think that's more torturous. <laughs> what a boring place heaven I must know. be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, some people have said, that they don't want to go to heaven because the kind of people that you meet there 
would be the world's worst bores. I mean, presumably <laughs> Jerry Falwell will be there and Pat <laughs> Robertson and, you know, who wants to listen to them for all eternity? Now, there's torture. <laughs> but um, you're right. The, the ancient idea of heaven, paradise, as a sort of perpetual orgasm was the original notion of bliss, which, you know, that has appeal. But the, the whole idea of Carl singing for all eternity in this God who is so incredibly eager for praise all the time. I mean, what an ego. He wants to hear nothing but praise. People are constantly thinking that they have to flatter him until the cows come home. Oh, I don't dear. think I would Ugh. like him anyway. <laughs> he doesn't sound like a very likable character, but he does sound like the personalities of men that I have known. You know, some of them are very big egos, and that God is the biggest ego of all. As above, yeah. so below it happened. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we have created this image. We mean male humanity, mostly. Nature does not make gods, but humans make gods, and they make them in their own image, pretty much. Men get together and decide what they want their god to be, and there he is. Women are not making goddess figures anymore, but possibly it may come back someday. Who knows? The goddesses were a lot more, a lot more kindly. Uh, they didn't regard sex as sinful. They never created a hell. They didn't abuse their children. Um, they were more, more accepting, more tolerant. So I think uh, the return to a goddess figure as a metaphor might do us some good. I mean, we know that there aren't any god figures really out there, but if we're going to use a metaphor, the Mother Earth, Mother Nature metaphor is probably the best one we've come up with. And how is your outlook these days? Do you have a positive outlook that the perhaps the divine feminine image is returning or kind of more uh, cynical like, you know, things get better on this part of the world, but in other parts of the world, things get even worse. Fundamentalism could just get stronger in the Middle East, in America, you know, where you put a finger in the dam, suddenly another hole explodes. Uh, it, 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 like you say, it depends on where you are. I know I have been involved in a number of women's groups uh, who are working on restoring a goddess imagery. And there are many of them, and they're very enthusiastic about this. And I understand that in Europe, particularly, uh, the churches are going empty. People are not going, are not being as brainwashed as they used to be. Of course, we have the threat of Islam, which is a ferociously patriarchal faith, and they are reproducing at a much faster rate than non is non-Muslims, of course, because they have polygamy, and they're just as the Catholic Church in its early days said, women must be made to bear as many children as possible. Well, in Islam, they're they're working that out. So they will outnumber us uh, within several generations. I don't know. I I think once the genie is out of the bottle about what Christianity is and where it really came from, I think it will not be possible to destroy all that information again. There have been several Catholic authorities who have been saying, like Tom Harper, who wrote the, the several books about this, the savior figure is pagan, and we should embrace it because it's all we have. We should realize that this is a part of our heritage, which it is. But we should understand where it really comes from and not try to create history out of mythology. To me, this, this makes sense. I think it's a toss-up. It, it pretty much depends on uh, circumstance, what happens in our near future or even distant future. But I think traditional Christianity, as it has been throughout 2,000 years, well, 1,500 maybe, uh, is, is kind of on the way out. I think it won't be able to 
uphold the same kind of credulity and superstition that it has worked on so far. Well, Barbara, I think that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on Aeon Bite and discussing your new book, A Man-Made God. You're very welcome, and it was a pleasure. Uh, pleasure is all mine, and uh, again, thank you very much, and have yourself a good day. Okay. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. Barbara Walker giving us a good overview, but truly just a sinful taste of her new book, Man Made God. A miniature but thorough encyclopedia on everything you wanted to know about the goddess and probably everything you probably might not have wanted to know about the true repression of Yaldi Baldi and his cosmic monkey shines and celestial date raping of the human consciousness. And Man Made Gad is published by Stellar House Publishing, owned by my mentor and friend, DM Murdoch, also known as Acharya S. Check it out and check into the true reality of the Tron world we live in for a moment to spell. And again, I couldn't think of a more honorable guest to have on Aeon Bites 4th Anniversary. Believe it or not, I began years ago thinking I'd simply ejaculate six episodes for the owner of Free Thought Media Dad Cam. I had recently been excommunicated from a Gnostic church, waiting in line to be initiated into a secret brotherhood, and thought I'd genocide some time by putting out an overview of Gnosticism on the internets. But there was no Morpheus around to tell me how deep the rabbit hole would go because then came seven, and eight, and nine, and soon I was floating in a vast universe of wonder, never having imagined the depth of the Gnostic ether, how it touched other traditions in the vacuum of orthodoxy, how it had shaped history, and the history behind history we call myth. And interestingly enough, the secret brotherhood ended up rejecting me because they thought I was giving away too much secret information. Sorry, oh reverend douchebags, but I had decided that the truth was for all who were thirsty for it, that it should be available as crack on a south side street corner, or as billions of dollars are available for bailouts to billionaire bankers. I think Philip K. Dick put it best when he wrote, since the universe is actually composed of information, then it can be said that information will save us. This is the saving gnosis which the Gnostics sought. There is no other road to salvation. However, this information, or more precisely the ability to read and understand this information, the universe as information, can only be made available to us by the Holy Spirit. We cannot find it on our own. Thus it is said that we are saved by the grace of God, and not by good works, that all salvation belongs to Christ, who, I say, is a physician. And the journey continues, the journey of knowledge, information, truth, and gnosis, and I have paid a very high price in my healing, and hopefully yours too. I am not the same person I was four years ago. My views are different. They have altered, kinder perhaps, but sharper like a scalpel when it comes to bleeding the truth. And the Archons have both cursed me, as have the Aeons blessed me. Ah, my beloved true seekers, if I had only done a six series podcast on Fundy Christianity or Scientology, perhaps I'd have some money in my pocket and a nice Truman Show like environment. I could live in a purdy moonbat illusion with its golden bars and three amnesia inducing meals a day. But paraphrasing William Blake, I decided to make my own system rather than to be ruled by another man's system. I chose the way of the heretic, and it seems so have you. So welcome to the machine, my son, and the means to escape it. Amun Ra. Thus, we are the Gnostics, 
those veterans of a thousand psychic wars who have set the controls to the heart of the sun. We are the revenge of the myth who eternally attempt to rescue Hypatia of Alexandria. We're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. We keep the faith, fight the good fight, and finish the race. We cultivate Gnosis, that self-knowledge, that acquaintance of the divine, that knowing of the unknown, that ship smoke on the horizon. And we won't get fooled again by the old or the new or any boss. We continue on this dark odyssey. This is a dream of you. Thank you for keeping me company while the hordes of hell come barreling down upon us. Our fates are sealed. Our doom is nigh, but we've already won. Can't you see Sophia descending on the battlefield of the true seeker warrior? We continue on this dark odyssey. Her light shines upon us. Hello and goodbye as always. <laughs>